Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I already see everybody in the comments section, so so excited to see you all here. It is episode 10 of the uh, Raw Intuition Health Show, so thank you guys for being here. Today we have an outstanding guest for you. We've got Dr. Will Tuttle joining us to talk about his new book that's going to be coming out in the next few months called Food for Freedom. And so I'm really excited for this book. I loved his his other book, The World Peace Diet. If you haven't read this one, I highly recommend getting this one as well. Um, Life-changing book. So definitely check it out. Um, so we're going to talk about his new book, Food for Freedom, and you know how food impacts the the level of freedom that uh that we all experience i know i've i've had some you know just uh you know crazy revelations and and you know awakenings from my past life and and how you know really lacking freedom i i was experiencing and so we're gonna i'm gonna share some of these things with dr tuttle and, and he can expand upon those and and you know talk i'm sure a lot of it's going to relate to his book so uh, let's get Dr. Tuttle in here. Oops. There we go. Hey, how are you, Dr. Tuttle? I'm doing great, Matt. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So as you guys know, we do the topic discussion, which um, you know I'm going to let Dr. Tuttle speak most of this time because I want to let him speak about his book and you know all the new things he has going on. Um, but I'm going to intersperse some of some of my uh, questions and ideas for him to expand upon. But um, just so you guys know, as every week, we have a free giveaway uh, for somebody that asks a question in the Q&A section at the end of the show. Um, I'm giving away a copy of my latest book, Five Star Salad Revolution, and an ebook. So I'll email that to you if, if you're selected as the winner. And Dr. Tuttle has generously offered to give a free audio book of The World Peace Diet. So thank you so much, Dr. Tuttle, for offering that to somebody mm. that asked a question. Absolutely. Yes. My honor. All right. <clears throat> Great. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get started here. Um, so what, um, you know, what made you want to write another book and, and why did you, uh, decide on, on food for freedom as, as the subject? Right. Yeah. You know, the, the uh, world peace diet, I wrote that book to be evergreen in a sense. I mean, it, it talks about universal principles that are, are, true 10,000 years ago and today and will still be true 10,000 years and, and in the future and which we are uh, unaware of for the most part, or at least we're maybe aware of them, but we're not following them. And these universal principles, uh, I think when we understand them more deeply, especially as they relate to our interrelationships, not only with each other, but especially with animals and our earth and the routine, routine mistreatment of animals for food and other products, it really creates, I think, within us a, a very empowering understanding of how we can transform our lives and how we can help be part of the solution to the problems on this earth rather than just simply being part of the problem. And a lot of it has to do really, like I said, with the cultural indoctrination, the official stories, the official narratives about food and about our relationship with animals and nature and between men and women. It's all interconnected and how the basically a, a very powerful plutocratic uh, class has been able to um, treat gradually treat human beings the same way we treat cows and pigs and chickens, basically as livestock. So the World Peace Diet, uh, it, it is a, a, a war. It's a it's a solution, basically, I think, to our problems. It lays the foundation for a world where peace and freedom and justice and equality are possible. But it requires us to liberate animals. We, we're, we're never going to have health and freedom if we're going to insist on imprisoning animals and then eating their flesh and dairy products and eggs, not only because those uh, concentrate a lot of toxins, but really the attitudes that are required to do that on a mass scale, like we're doing, or even on a small scale, it, it's the same thing. It's I'm going to, I own you, I can do with you whatever I want, I'm going to kill, I have you, I'm going to impregnate your, you and then I'm going to steal your babies and kill your babies and, and I'm going to keep doing that. I mean, it's a, a sexual abuse, killing, imprisoning 
really, when you look at it carefully, it's actually satanic. I mean, what, what we see as satanism is harming others for my own benefit and having no qualms about it, right? I mean, just yeah. that's what we're doing. I mean, it's really off the charts, but we we are so used to it because we're born into it that we don't realize it. So that book stands on its own and it's really the foundation of i think a world where we can actually have a positive future but i felt the need for this book food for freedom to take it the next step to show how over especially over the last three years what we've been seeing i've been warning about this for 30 years i've been saying if we're going to insist on exploiting animals, on microchipping them, on tracking them, on force medicating them, all these things and breaking up their families. You know, we're going to see the same thing happening to us. I mean, why? Because the, the number one principle in all the world wisdom traditions is whatever you sow, so shall you reap. I mean, we know that if we plant carrots, we're not going to get celery or broccoli, we're going to get carrots. And if we're going to insist on continuing to sow the seeds, of dominating and exploiting animals and stealing their health and stealing their purposes. What makes us think that we can magically live a free, happy, healthy life when that we're just destroying that for other beings who have interests that are to them as important to them as our interests are to us. So this is a huge blind spot in our society. It's massive blind spot. It's, uh, Carl Jung talked about it as a shadow, you know, psychological shadow. And the larger and more devastating a shadow is, the more invisible it is. That's the irony of it. You'd think mm -hmm. you think you could see it. You'd be so obvious. But the bigger it is, the more it's like, we don't see that. It's not, I don't know where it is. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, now we can really see it happening. So I started, you know, I, I knew, I mean, you, you, you were probably the same way, but I knew as soon as back in, 19, in uh, 2019, I started hearing rumblings about a pandemic. I was already thinking this is a scam. And then and as soon as it, as soon as they started their ridiculous thing, I, I, you know, Madeline and I were both new. This is another one of their false flags to imprison humanity. And, and then when they came out with a PCR test, I, you know, I, I was, I, I became very early on aware of the work of Carrie Mullis, who actually invented the PCR test and who said very clearly, you can never use this to diagnose anything. Right. It's not a diagnostic tool. It's, it's for a completely different kind of uh, thing. And I read his book and uh, he talks about the, how he invented this, uh, the PCR test. And then I found out that the WHO is using that as the gold standard to determine whether or not people have COVID. And then all these people are saying, oh, I got COVID. I got COVID. How do you know you have COVID? Oh, I got the test. It said I had COVID. <laughs> I mean, it was such an obvious scam. And I thought, nobody's going to fall for this. This is so ridiculous. And yet everybody. And then I started hearing that people were wearing masks. They said pe to, for people to wear masks. And uh, I thought, well, and I, and I saw these pictures of people wearing masks in China and in Europe. And I thought, oh, Americans will never do that. I mean, that's ridiculous. Nobody in the United States would be that, you know. And then, and then you know, and we're kind of living out in the country. We don't, we're not in a city or even okay. a suburb. We're just out there. Uh, but, you know, we, once a week we go into the little town where we get our gro It's a one store. We get our groceries and we get our hardware in the same store, you know, <laughs> and we went into that store and they were all wearing masks. I was like, oh, my gosh. So I, I didn't realize that my beloved fellow citizens were sitting in front of the television just drinking in lie upon lie upon lie and believing it from the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. And then I wrote a few things on Facebook about how ridiculous it was. We should all get together and party and just ignore the whole thing. I couldn't believe it. All of the, the entire vegan community attacked me yes. like yeah, I'm, I'm totally crazy, irresponsible person for saying we should ignore this whole thing. And then I realized the whole vegan community, for the most part, bought into it. So I, would, I, I felt really disturbed and I, and I, and I had I have very intelligent conversations with about these kinds of things. I realized I got nowhere. I mean, it, it wouldn't go anywhere. They, they looked at me like I was uh, some kind of uh, not, not having any critical thinking. They said, I don't have critical thinking skills. I mean, 
And these are people, I mean, quite honestly, it, you know, I, I taught college courses in epistemology. I mean, I used to teach college and that's the, the branch of philosophy that studies how do you know what you think is true is actually true. I used to teach college courses in epistemology and um, for quite a few years, you know, critical thinking, all these things. And I have a PhD from Berkeley uh, where I took courses in quantitative and qualitative methods of research. Uh, and, and so I've, I've, I know how scientific research is done. And I understand. And so maybe that was why I knew it was a big scam, because I, I know, you know, I, from studying this carefully, you can construct science and do research to prove anything at all. And the way corporations have invaded academia and the way corporations have invaded governmental agencies, I understood all that. Yeah. And I realized most people are completely oblivious. They have no idea how the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry and the petroleum industry and the bankers in the background have taken control over the agencies that we rely on, like the uh, CDC and the FDA and the HHS and, uh, and all these. And, uh, and I also understood how the CIA and DARPA and the military also behind a lot of the things that we're seeing on the internet and, and use, using the internet basically as a surveillance tool and as a censorship tool and as a control tool. And so I, I was aware of these things and I thought most people must be more or less aware of that. I mean, we're not that stupid. We, we know that. And especially vegans, because yes. the whole idea in veganism is we want to liberate animals. We want freedom for animals. And we know everyone knows that the pharmaceutical industry just tortures millions of animals in their, their products. And, and I talked about in the World Peace Diet how there's over 10,000 drugs uh, and chemicals that the pharmaceutical and the chemical, these are two sister industries that they use on animals. You know, the animals, the cows and pigs and chickens and factory farm fish that people are eating, antibiotics. I mean, like 75% of the antibiotics are used on these animals. They make massive profits on animals that are drugged on a massive scale of hormones, all kinds of things. And, and then people eat that stuff and they get diabetes and liver disease and kidney disease and, and, and heart, they need heart medications and all this stuff. So the pharmaceutical industry requires animal agriculture for its profits and, and, you, and draw, profits directly and indirectly and tortures animals. So how could vegans ever trust the pharmaceutical industry? That's the number one enemy of veganism. It's the number one enemy of the earth and the environment and animals. The pharmaceutical industry is based on, on the most hideous uh, torture and killing and poisoning of the earth. And so I thought, no way vegans are going to believe big, you know, Pfizer and Moderna and these companies and, and go along. And yet I saw like even the, um, the Vegan Society of London recommended that everyone get vaccinated. And I, I could, and I, I always every year spoke at the Veg Fest in San Francisco, the Veg Fest in uh, Santa Rosa, the Veg Fest in Sacramento, because I live, you know, in Northern California here. Yeah. None of them would allow me to even speak. In San Francisco, they said, "Well, you are recommending against vaccines, but if people don't get vaccinated, then they won't be healthy, and we won't be able to spread the vegan message anymore." Or something like that. I mean, I, I mean, can you believe it? I mean, that's like saying. Um, well, you know, if you don't eat dairy, then you're not going to be healthy and you won't be able to spread the vegan message anymore. You know? Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these vaccines are like totally filled with animal products. They're tested on animals. They're animal. They're, they're abuse of animals. And you're going to, you need to take the abuse of animals so you can talk against the abuse of animals. That, that's kind of the logic of the fear. That's what, see, the thing is fear just destroys people's, uh, wisdom. Yeah, I realized that. And so what the media was doing was this nonstop fear porn uh, and and just uh, and, and working to kind of make us fight with each other, too, as part yeah. of it and divide. It's kind of a divide and conquer thing. And then I realized also it's a very sophisticated um, kind of a military, you know, sort of they call it fifth generation uh, a military intelligence operation uh, warfare, where instead of a, instead of uh winning a war by attacking with physically you win the war by attacking mentally you attack the minds and the and the actual 
enemy is 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 the people i mean that's actually what it is it's like the the bankers the the thing is we have to understand this and in the research i did for food for freedom i just did the math you know it's pretty obvious that there's about eight to ten thousand people who are who are controlling the world mm. you know when you look at it i mean there's there's if you t if you just look at the number of people say roughly say eight thousand people who are the most wealthy and powerful bankers, the, the heads of the large corporations, the heads of, the, of all of the major universities, the heads of the main, main media conglomerates, uh, the, the military, and this is worldwide, we're talking about worldwide, the, the military, the intelligence communities, um, the, the main religious uh, communities. I mean, these people, they know each other. They all know each other. They go to the World Economic Forum meetings. They go to the uh, the Council on Foreign Relations meetings and, and the Bilderberg meetings and the and all the United Nations. All these they, they party together. They know each other, and they're incredibly wealthy plutocrats. They like their uh, wealth is directly translatable into power because when you have wealth, you can buy media. And when you buy media, you buy the narrative. And when you buy the narrative, you buy the story that people are telling themselves. And so 8,000 people, that is one ten thousandth of 1% of the human population. One ten thousandth of 1% of the human population controls the narrative that the other massive amount of humans all believe. We all believe it because it's it's, it goes through the educational system, through the, they own academia, they own government, they own media, they own Hollywood, uh, music, all the musicians, all the actors, they all get jabbed, they all went along, they're all paid, they're all paid off. That's the thing. And so it's easy for this one ten thousandth of 1% to then pay the 1%, which is about 8 million people, who they, they're the sort of lower and middle management and upper management of all these corporations and governmental, you know, they get paid very well and they just do what they're told and they make, they make a lot of money. And, and then the 99%, here we are. <laughs> and, and the thing is human beings, like all mammals, we have a sense of fairness. That's deep. It's like, it's grounded. If someone gives something to me, I feel obligated to, to give something back to them. You know, this is something we know. We we feel this, it's at the deepest level of all mammals. So the only way you can have a situation of gross unfairness, injustice, like we have one ten thousandth of one percent controlling everybody. Right now, one percent of the population has more wealth, uh, has twice as much wealth as everybody else. That's how gross the inequality is. The only way that can be maintained is through deception. You, you, that's the only way. We have to deceive that one, that one ten thousandth of one percent uh, has to deceive everybody else in, in, just in some way to make it think that it's, it's good. It's good. It's nothing wrong with this. This is fine. This is, yeah, I mean, you know, we're glad. Oh, we got, oh, everything's great. You know, we have technology. We have, uh, yeah, we have everything's fine, you know, and uh, that's, the, so that's what's happening. And we don't see Oh, we are being treated more and more livestock and we're having our freedom taken away uh, really the way uh, it, it happens on dairy like little cows are born on a dairy and it's the basic word of is I own you and I own your calf <laughs> and wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna inject your calf with these injections whether you like it or not and I actually heard on the during the pandemic this woman was arguing uh, there was a video of it with a hot with hospital administrator. She was pregnant and she was you know, going to give birth in this hospital. And the hospital administrator said to her, look, as long as the baby's inside of you, it's your baby. But when it comes out, it's not your baby anymore. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, she said it directly. That's it. You know, when, once it comes out, it's not yours. Mm -hmm. Don't think it, you know, and that's the basic mentality on a dairy. It's the basic mentality everywhere. You better, you know, and they have actual doctors whose job it is um, to make sure that parents are following all the protocols with their children. And if they're not, they'll take the kids away. They'll make them do it. And so this is what happens on a dairy. I mean, it's, it's, it's factory farming of human beings. And yet, so there has to be a narrative of fear to get us to think, oh, but if we don't, it would be terrible. We'd all get sick, you know, and that's a big lie. So. In, the, in, the, in this book, Food for Freedom, I uncover the multiple levels of the narrative 
it, 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 it's a big book. It's actually longer than the World Peace Diet because there's so much to really understand in the way um, the, the narrative of animal agriculture feeds into f our fear of nature, which feeds into the germ theory. Oh, I'm, there's germs, there's bacteria, we're afraid. You know, instead of naturally feeling like when we're in harmony with animals and we're eating a plant-based diet, especially an organic, whole, healthy plant-based diet, and we feel a sense of abundance and harmony with the earth, with our food, we're growing our own food, we're working like we have a garden here, we have 76 now we're up to 76 trees we've planted, wow. uh, basically fruit trees, lots of we, right now we're just harvesting a fantastic harvest of walnuts and persimmons. And um, so we planted these and so we've been doing this for 10 years, 11 years, actually been and, and the trees are getting big enough that we're getting really a lot of fruit. And um, and we also have veggie, you know, we have six raised beds of vegetables. We're getting lots of cucumbers and squashes and tomatoes and all this other stuff and greens. And so we're out here working and it's beautiful to see how you with love you the earth loves us back you know you don't have to stab these animals and kick them and rape them and steal them we can we can live this way and so when we do that we have instead of the germ theory we're attracted to something more like the terrain theory which is that basically our health is a reflection of our consciousness basically in our in, in our relationship with nature the quality of the terrain of our physical body. So the problem really is, and I go into this in the book, historically, when when Rockefeller uh, you know, gets so wealthy through petroleum, he was very savvy. I'm not sure how he got these ideas, but, but he realized that he could make more money by refining petroleum into chemicals and creating petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. And then taking control of the medical industry, because the medical industry back 120 years ago, uh, it was it was wide open. There was a lot of people who were uh, doing homeopathy, who were doing natural healing, who were doing herbs, uh, chiropractic, all kinds of different things. And he he was able through the Flexner report to basically say that the only scientific, you know, he he kind of co-opted science are these are petrochemicals and they refine the petrochemicals into pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals are just petroleum that's, that have been refined not once but twice and they're poison. Just like petrochemicals are poison. And so the more they can poison us, either through petrochemicals or through pharmaceuticals, the more our health deteriorates, the more our health deteriorates, the more we are dependent on them for more petro, for more pharmaceuticals. And the more our health deteriorates, the easier we are to control. I mean, their worst fear is people like me who haven't been to a doctor in 50 years, who haven't been to a pharmacy in 50 years, who is not afraid of them, you know, I mean, you know, when we when we're healthy and we're vibrant and we're thinking for ourselves, then we're not easily controllable. It's like wild animals, you know, wild animals are very hard to control. We have a this garden and we put up a, a, a nylon fence in the very beginning to keep the deer out because they were coming right in and eat everything. And it worked perfectly. The deer never came in. But one day a deer got in uh, through a somehow a gate or something and when she was, when she got in, she realized she was trapped and she, she destroyed our fence. <laughs> she, oh, no. she just broke it down, <laughs> you know? And I realized like the worst thing you can do to a wild free living animal is to try to confine their body. Yes. So, but what we do is we just have the, these animals born into captivity. They're born right into slavery. And so they don't know any difference. So they just sit there and it's very hard to liberate those animals. You, you take them, they don't even want to get out. They don't know, they don't know anything else. That's happening to us. We're, we're now, we're having, ch our children are being born into computer games and, 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 and this whole matrix of control yep. that I wasn't born into. I feel so grateful. I'm 70 now. I can't believe it. I mean, the time flies by. And, um, and, and I, I just feel like we have to realize that we are free, sovereign beings. We're in a society, but it's important for us to maintain our sovereignty, our freedom of expression, our freedom of bodily autonomy, our freedom to assemble and religion. And all these things are critical. If we don't have that, we can't live our lives. We, 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 we're becoming, we, we become slaves. We become exploited. Just like cows and, and pigs, they, they, you know, right now, there are chickens 
living freely in the jungles of Southeast Asia. They're flying around in the trees. They're living like they did for millions of years and they're free and they're fulfilling their, their destinies and their, and their hormonal changes and their family structures and all that stuff. And same with pigs. There's pigs, wild pigs right out in the wilderness out here living their lives. And there are ducks and geese and there are um, fish and all these animals. The only animals that are not freely living out in nature are cows. And the last free living wild cow was killed just about like 300 years ago in Poland. Mm. Uh, but up until then, they were living free. But now they they are they're, when you look at these poor, like we've been to these farms, these factory farms or any farm where a poor animal, they're stuck in a cage. They're stuck in some kind of a place they can't. They're not living their lives how they did. And it's a tragedy. And the thing we have to understand is only slaves would actually do that to animals. We have to be slaves ourselves to tolerate living in a society with millions, billions, really, when you consider um, marine animals, of animals enslaved. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, and actually trillions when you get to marine animals, I mean, that we're killing. So um, that kind of massive enslavement of other living beings, it turns us basically into slaves. And I've seen it. People say, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, we have a few chickens and we get their eggs. I mean, they're happy. Well, nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's, there, we take care of them. There's nothing wrong with that. We, their eggs are healthy. I mean, we, we love them. I mean, it's much better. They, otherwise, they'd be, they'd be out in nature. They might get attacked by, by wild coyotes or who knows what. And, and that's, that's a slave talking. I mean, if, you, if we can't see that, the, that you've got a bunch of females with no males, you have stolen their sovereignty, you steal their eggs, you steal their purposes, you think that that's good? I mean, people said the same thing about, you know, in slavery. All these black people, they'd be running around like a bunch of, you know, wild animals in Africa. We're giving them an education. We're taking care of them. I mean, we look at that and we think how dark, how, how like racist and it was. But it's the same thing when we're doing it now with these animals. We don't see it because we're born into this blindness. And uh, so the whole idea really is, is a positive is that we don't um, need to do this, right? There's no nutrients. Here I am, you know, 43, almost 44 years now since 1980. Uh, they haven't eaten any animal foods. I'm doing fine, probably a lot better than anybody else eating animal foods. And so this, and, and it's not, I'm not the only one. My Madeline's the same way, my wife, and there's literally millions of people who are long-term vegans who are doing great. And we're not, and some people say, well, you're, you're just unique. You know, you're different from everybody else. <laughs> we're not, we're, we have the same basic physiology. I don't have a different digestive system and endocrine system than anybody else. I mean, right. so it's just this programming. You know, people are so afraid to be different. You know, we want to, we want to comply and be like everybody else. We're so tribal. And, you know, I go into that quite a bit in the new book. So the new book is basically has three parts. The uh, first part kind of lays out the thing. The second part goes into it more deeply and all of the, like what masking really does to us. And, and some of the other uh, toxic narratives, like the depopulation agenda, this whole idea that there's too many people. No, how can we say there's too many people? We don't know. I mean, if that's ridiculous to say that they're trying to kill off they're trying to cull the herd we have to really be aware of that uh the whole climate change narrative uh that we have to have to have we can't travel anymore because of carbon <laughs> like carbon is some kind of terrible thing right. and um so you know all these and then the third part is the positive part which i i talk about the uh the, the six main ways that we can thrive and be healthy so the, six, the third part it's really just all the things we can do uh, through meditation, through relationships, through nutrition, through creativity and intuition and um, uh, music and all these different things that we can actually cultivate in our lives so we so our health is great. So the, the title of the book is Food for Freedom, Reclaiming Our Health and Rescuing Our World. And those that's the main thing. We can reclaim health once we understand what's really happening here and not be so gullible and believe the official stories and we can rescue our world because of the way the trajectory we're going is a trajectory of slavery and and worse even i mean because the kind of slavery that we're inflicting on animals is really severe and 
some people say, well, you know, people like uh, like um, these people in the in, in concentration camps, they're still able to find some meaning uh, because of their inner. They have that inner freedom to do that, even in a concentration camp. And that's that's true. But the kind of thing we see coming, if you really not to be negative, but really the kind of concentration camp that the globalists have in mind for us, when, if you're if you're born into slavery where you don't even know anything else yeah. there is no chance to even connect with meaning i mean i think it's really it, it, we're not we're not fooling around here we really need to absolutely never comply with any of this stuff because if we do it's going in that direction they have with a technology today of surveillance and and the and the agenda to microchip or to have everyone trackable through a central bank digital currency where you can't you you can't participate economically unless you're getting vaccinated or whatever you know everything could be easily controlled with a kind of global 5g system that they rolled out when nobody was looking during i can't believe it i mean we we tra we didn't travel uh, for a few months in 2020, we, we came back here. I, I was doing this tour and the last th two events, they canceled on us. We didn't want to cancel them. It was, it was March, I think. And we, we had an events in Southern California and San Jose and they were the first people locked down. <laughs> they wouldn't do, we couldn't do our talk. And we said, come on. I mean, but then, so we came back home here to North, up North in, in Lake County. And then we went out, uh, in, do a tour in November, December to Florida, where things were much better. And but we noticed all these antennas just magically went up everywhere. Mm. These five G antennas, these strange-looking things. And uh, so this this infrastructure has been put into place, and it really requires us to reject it because uh you know otherwise that's all that's a, it's called the panopticon a panopticon is a prison where one or two people can oversee hundreds of people you know or thousands or even you know tens of thousands of people that's the kind of thing that the technology we, we think we keep getting told that technology is our friend mm -hmm. and in some ways it is but man the more research i do the more i see that for the most part the technology is being weaponized against us yeah. and we have to understand that and not embrace these things uh with our eyes closed we better really be mindful uh, of these things so there's a lot more we can unpack about all this but th those are the main ideas yeah wow that is a book i'll definitely be buying i mean i think <laughs> you know you you i align with your message i think more than anybody um you just you speak so much truth and so clearly and easy to understand um, and, and like you said, yeah, they're, they're weaponizing, you know, technology as well as science, as well as the food as well, you know, every, everything is being basically weaponized against us. And yeah, if we don't stand up against that, um, yeah, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be good. So, um, as how, I guess, how, how do you, and I've got some other questions, but how, how do you, how do you stay positive? with with all the things that you know you know that are going on i know there's a lot of people out there that um they're unaware of a lot of it you know they're kind of wearing rose-colored glasses about this the whole situation um how, for the people that are aware or that are just becoming aware what advice do you have for people that uh you know to to keep hope or stay positive or how to how to make a difference Great question. Thanks, Matt. You know, I, I have to say, I've been a vegan for now for 43 years. There, in a way, certain way, there's no way to avoid excruciating pain in taking back the curtain and looking at what we do to animals on factory farms or on even little small farm. People say factory farms. It's, it's any farm. I mean, any farm, you're imprisoning and killing and betraying and horribly and the, and the slaughterhouses, the, the unbelievable violence that is committed. And so I pulled back the curtain and I saw that. And I've been in, in for the last few years, I've been pulling back the curtain and seeing the violence. I mean, I, you know, I'll just mention it, but we don't, we don't have to talk about it, but what, it, it, you know, the trafficking of children, the mm -hmm. sexual abuse of children, this whole adrenochrome thing. I mean, we're, we're seeing, the torturing and killing of animals and human beings on a massive scale. So there's no way on one level to be smiling and happy about everything on planet earth, right? Yeah. It's 
really a lot of terrible darkness. And we have to understand that it is these in many ways, these, this one ten thousandth of one percent that is in, that is engaging in this on a massive scale and on terribly satanic, hideously violent, abusive things to, to humans. That's part of their thing. So I have no, um, I, you know, I, I don't hold back for my for myself. I'm willing to look at this. But I'm very positive, uh, essentially. I'm very, I'm very positive because, of, I guess, of my meditation practice. When I, you know, I, earlier in my life, I was, I just right after college, I left home and I went on a spiritual pilgrimage with my brother, and we gave, we had no money, we just walked. We thought we we're going to walk to California with nothing, and so I learned. Um, you know, how, you know, I learned all kinds, I mean, I stayed in, we stayed in jails and rescue missions. I learned how to dumpster dive. I learned, you know, all kind. I learned how to not have anything and somehow survive, you know, for, for a long time, we just survived and, and not only survived, we thrived. I mean, it was like what Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and everything else shall be added unto you. If we focus on the spiritual awakening, and that's the most important thing, this world in many ways is a dream. It's an illusion. It's actually an illusion. It's arising in our consciousness. It's a, really a mirror of our own mind. And what we are, it, and it's hard to say this to people, I mean, to, to all of us, when we don't, when we live in a society that teaches us the opposite of this from the time of little kids, we're taught that we're just an object, a physical thing, this body, like this, this thing that was born and will die. And we have to protect it. And we have to get what we want for it. And we have to keep away what we don't want. So we're in a constant battle to try to get enough money and get enough relationships and get enough love and keep away all the bad things. Everyone is fighting with each other because there's not enough to go around. And we're, and you have to understand that whole thing is an illusion. What we are is not this body. What we are is the infinite consciousness that's eternal, that, that is functioning for a few short decades through this vehicle. I remember, you know, and, and we, my brother, when I, we were just 20, I was 20, he was 20, I think I was just turned 22. We were, we were walking and we were contemplating this all the time. And I remember like, what, just as an example, one time we were in this, we walked into this little church in West Virginia somewhere in the Bible Belt. And, and those little towns, they're very suspicious of anybody coming into their town mm -hmm. back in 1975, you know, way back then. And um, we went into this church to, med to meditate and we went into the back, like behind, the, we walked through and then behind the altar, there was this door and back there, there was the Sunday school rooms. And we meditated and we went to sleep, actually. We were tired. We slept. We woke up and it was like seven o'clock or something in the evening and the whole church was full of people and they were having a service. And we were like, oh, no, they're going to if they discover us back here, they'll probably like throw us in jail. I mean, who knows what will happen? So um, we were kind of concerned, like, what are we going to do? Because we can't just stay here. Uh, they'll they'll find us. There's no way out. And and then I and then I said to Ed, wait a minute, we don't have to worry. We're not these bodies. <laughs> There's nothing to worry about. I mean, they can't they can't hurt us. You know, we're not these bodies. They can't hurt us. And then he said, yeah, you're right. I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we're not these bodies. So we just opened the door. We walked out. And I remember I had just such a feeling of like, we're the we're eternal consciousness, you know, and, and that transforms everything. They looked at us. and They were like. Oh, these angels are they're coming through you know <laughs> and they say oh you guys yeah we were waiting for you you know yeah come on sit down sing with us you know it's a great <laughs> yeah like it just shifts the energy when we wow. when you when we're afraid and we're this we think we're this body and we have to get then everybody contracts and we're all contracted when you when you just come with an open heart and know look our race our gender our story that's nothing that's total illusion we are infinite eternal consciousness all of us one being living through many forms that's what's happening so whatever it is that's the suffering we're going through we when we leave this body it's like it never happened it's like when we wake up well, i'm in a dream it happens all the time I'm in this dream it's so real i can feel i can see it i can feel it and then i wake up it's like oh yeah that was a dream it's a dream. It is a dream. We have to understand that totally. Doesn't mean that we don't take it seriously while we're in it and we don't have compassion for other beings and not cause them suffering because there is reality. But we also have to understand that what we are is what makes all of this possible. 
we're not the, the, the little actor. We're the witness of the action. And so every day, you know, I meditate, you know, every day. I mean, that's, that's the most important thing. And so uh, coming back into to silence and then living our life out of silence. And when we see, when we understand that about ourselves, then we can see it in others. And so then we're not trying to just, we don't, we don't limit them to just this enemy or this <clears throat> obstacle or whatever. We see that, well, you know, we're, they're wounded. Everybody's wounded. When someone's wounded, you don't, you don't kick them and spit on them. You say, well, you're wounded. I'll try to help you. you know? <laughs> so that's the basic feeling I have. There's this great story actually in the Taoist tradition that I think in some ways sums it all up. It's very brief. It's just, <clears throat> there's a guy and he's out on a lake and he's in a boat. And he's and it's a beautiful day and it's a little breeze and he says oh i'm just gonna lay down so he lays down in his boat and he's looking up at the clouds and the blue sky and he's so relaxed and just really happy and all of a sudden bam some other boat just slams into him and he's like what the heck and he's furious it's like god doesn't somebody know what they're doing and he sits up and he's ready to fight and this boat that just slammed into him there's no one in it. It's mm -hmm. empty. It's just, it was just the wind just blew it into him. So instead of fighting, he starts laughing. <laughs> <He's off laughs> an empty boat. It's always an empty boat. That's what we have to understand. When someone like slams into us and we think, oh, you, you, do, do, you, you know, it's an empty boat. It's the, we're all driven by currents of programming, of cultural wounding. We're born, our parents are hitting us, beating us. We're yelled at, so we, get, we yell at other people. Don't take it personally. It's an empty boat. It's all empty boats. And so once we understand that, instead of fighting and trying to change people, we see, all right, and we see the best in them. That's the best way to change anybody is just see the best in them. See that, but we can't do that if we don't see it in ourselves. Mm. So we have to do the inner work. And, that, and that's the thing. And the other thing is to understand that our life is very short. It's so brief. We're here. I mean, I can feel, I remember back when I was in my, like 25, I took this course in um, Chinese from this woman from China and she was teaching us Chinese and I was learning the language. And I remember uh, she said, if you ever go to China and you try to act like you know something, like you're an authority on something, and if you're not at least 60 years old, everybody's going to laugh at you because if you're not 60, you don't know anything. <laughs> it's a very traditional society and they just be they believe in this Confucian, you know, you honor the elders and you don't, you know, when you're young, you just don't know anything. And I remember when I was 25 thinking, when I'm 60, that's never going to happen. You know, that's so far away. It's like impossible. You know, I was like, in, in, and now I, I actually went to China a few years ago and I said, you have to listen to me because I am 60. <laughs> that was like, you know, like a few minutes later, I'm 60. It mm -hmm. flies by. So the whole idea is every day is precious. And even though I cannot change the outer world. The outer world, the dream is, is manifesting, but I can all, I always have power over my response to it. See, that's the great, joyful, positive message. I, I can't change the world. I mean, I can plant seeds that can perhaps bring positive change, but the whole idea is I can always change my response. I can choose how to respond to what's happening. And that's real freedom. Freedom is taking responsibility for the quality of our responses what I'm going to be eating, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to live my life, the kind of thoughts I'm having. That's what we bring with us. And we have to understand, we were taught that this, we're like, this is object that was born and will die in, in a meaningless universe that just came about by a big bang that had no meaning. I mean, that is a philosophy for slaves. You have to understand that, that whole thing. Yeah. If you want to enslave people, you teach them that kind of thing. Like we live in this random universe where just by random banging in of molecules and gases, somehow we have eyeballs and we have, you know, these complex systems and we have compassion, we have creativity of music. I mean, anyway, the, the, the fact that they actually teach that and yeah. people actually kind of go, yeah, that's evolution. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. It's like such an idiotic pathetic ridiculous slave story yeah. and and uh, and people actually get phds and all and and and, and, and walk you know and honor the white-coated people the priests who who preach this kind of slave uh mentality of meaninglessness if you want to enslave people you teach them that and then they just they're always afraid and they're trying to get something and this is all there is 
Oh, that, but once you understand your consciousness, and this is one life of many, and you're going to be, you know, what, how your next incarnation is going to depend on this. So you, so you always, you always have this possibility of learning and growing, and even more importantly, of unlearning <laughs> and letting right. go and coming back to your true nature, uh, which is always present. So this is a, a tremendously positive situation we're in we're here to learn to to help others to to uh we're, we're at a really critical time and uh the people who we see as enemies those are our teachers they're like creating situations for us okay how do we respond to this now how do we creatively um it's really a challenge cool okay what do we do and i think that we can see we can always find a positive way and uh, not to take things uh, personally and, and what they really, what, what they want and, you know, kind of in the, in the short term is for us to feel that way, to feel like, oh, we have no power. Yeah. You know, they have all the money. They have all the power. They, they control everything and we might as well give up. I mean, don't ever go there. That's ridiculous. We, a human being is so, is so beautiful and has such, such, incredible potential for for wisdom and power and and awareness and and, cre and creating positive change in our world we one individual i remember i was born in concord massachusetts and i and i didn't read thoreau till i got to college but i remember reading you know i learned to swim in walden pond i mean I, that's where i grew up right there and i remember thoreau when he wrote in his his essay of civil disobedience he said one person who's awake can stop the entire machinery of society, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, and he's right. He's totally yeah. right. You know, if one person who's awake has tremendous power. So that's up to each one of us. Each one of us has that capacity. So we shouldn't uh, look to other people to, to, to make changes. We can ourselves embody that and uh, do the best we can each one of us to, to be that in our own unique way. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Great, great, uh, great stuff. That's powerful. And I actually, so I, I before the show, I didn't know um, how much I was going to, um, you know, go over my stuff. But um, the three things that I wrote down for how food uh, created freedom in my life was um, one, what you just said is, you know, it, it showed me when I when I started eating healthy and living healthy, it, it showed me that um, you know, it, it freed me from that thinking that one person was insignificant. You know, I was just, I'm just one person. I can't do, you know, I can't change everything. It freed right, me from right. that mentality. Um, right. another thing that, it, that you've touched on here is the illusion of authority and that experts know what's best for me. Um, you know, right. relying on, on outside sources to tell me what's best for me in my life. Um, and like you said, it's great to get, you know, advice and, yeah. and wisdom from others, but you really got to touch into your, your intuition to, to really find the right way. And then also that health isn't just a random chance, right? Like if, if I would have, if I would have listened to authority, I would still be taking my asthma medication. I would still have eczema and depression mm. and all these things. So yeah, just the, the food, when you, when you get the food right, it frees your mind from so much of that slavery mentality and, and right. it shows you how powerful you really are. So I think that's, that's right in alignment with everything you, t you just said. Yeah, you know, I really want to touch on that, be, a couple of things, uh, because there's this whole, um, this whole story in the, in the vegan movement, I think it's a little less strong in the raw vegan movement, but in the vegan movement, which is where I've mainly been in, um, that we real, you know, we're vegan for the animals and for the earth, uh, and you know, if, for our health also. But you really have no much, a lot of control over your health, and I've had quite a few vegans really get angry with me or criticize me very strongly and say, "Will totally." He says how he's always healthy and never gets sick and doesn't go to the doctor and doesn't take any pharmaceutical drugs but most vegans are not like that most of us are humble and we realize that we need to go to the doctor we need to take our you know we're not different we we're going to get sick and, we're, and that's a, you know that's part of life and and he's really dangerous giving this idea that if you go vegan you're going to be healthy all the time and to me it's it's really it's it's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is we our call to take responsibility for our health. And these so-called vegans who are sick all the time, 
quite on not to criticize them but are they really taking response i mean they're not doing what i'm doing they're not going swimming in cold water every day they're not doing tai chi and qigong every day they're not meditating for two hours every day uh, they're not eating only organic whole plant-based foods only like never ever eating non-organic foods i mean madeline is like really on it we don't eat foods that are not organic i mean we need to stop being victims and and really see that we have tremendous power to, to be healthy and that the and then if we care about animals we should be healthy who wants to be a vegan if they if a bunch of sick vegans running around saying well yeah we got to take drugs too like everybody else yeah that's really irresponsible if you care about animals and you care about generations you care about hungry people you want to have people uh think that veganism is a great thing then you we should be radiantly healthy why not yeah. why, why shouldn't we be radiantly healthy we are we are uh, i mean we, while the free living animals are healthy they're running around healthy well, why shouldn't we be healthy unless they're you know taking in human uh chemicals and things so that's why I, I love uh, I like the raw vegan movement because there really is this sense of we we're healthy <laughs> we're going to yeah. make sure we're responsible for our health and we need to combine that you know the ethical part of caring for animals uh, and and the bigger with our own health they, they go to, and our being healthy is a you know making an effort to be very healthy is really compassionate to animals and to other people because when you see when we walk around and we see these people I mean they're the obese and and unhealthy aesthetically it's it's a downer i mean it's like you know it's just it's not nice to see it and and feels like it's heavy it's like when we see people that are like trim and radiant and and have this uh life force in them it makes everybody better and it's much better for all of us i mean people who are chronically sick quite honestly we all have to take care of them we have to i have to pay more for everything to pay for the drugs that all these people are taking it's higher prices for everybody and then we have to take care of them I and mean, i've seen people many times the, the like the the one spouse they maybe the, the wife uh she cares about her health and she's a vegan and the husband said well you know i'm going to eat however i want and so he has a stroke mm. he, she has to take care of him for the next 10 years till he dies and she, she he steals her freedom because he wants to eat how he wants to eat you know this happens all the time and 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 then there's this whole thing like well you should be proud to be fat you know you should be proud you know we should be proud to be this and that i mean leave the pride out of it pride is is the first of the seven deadly sins and uh it's nothing to be proud of I and mean, we say we're proud to be humans how do the cows feel about us proud humans that we're so proud it means i can dominate and exploit i mean we should really try to cultivate humility i think and and live in accordance with the laws of of health which really have a high fiber and compassion and kindness and have relations a lot of people are unhealthy and sick because they haven't forgiven other people they haven't forgiven their parents and they're still yeah. angry you know anger will create tremendous toxicity in our bodies uh, fear will create a lot of toxicity in our bodies it, we, it, people are afraid of the sun i mean I, god i'm out in the sun the people are afraid of of carbon dioxide <laughs> you know people are wearing masks i mean the yeah. worst thing you can do is wear a mask it's like eating your own excrement you know, we're we're constantly getting rid of waste and you have this dead air space behind a mask you're rebreathing over 200 toxic gases that the body's trying to eliminate mm. I mean, all these fear-based things are destroying our health and and then people say oh i'm wearing my mask to be healthy i'm getting taking drugs to be health <laughs> taking drugs to be healthy i mean you kidding me i mean that's those are toxic chemicals that are, that are working directly against your body you know it, it the whole idea is we should be cleansing we should be fasting maybe do some fasting yeah so, you know i did a lot of fasting i mean are these people fasting and 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 purifying and eating only uh really clean food and and having and water and and uh, air and i mean all these things we we're we're, we're really called to have a, a big view and the pans people a lot of people are using pans cooking in pans uh that are leaching metals like we have expensive pans you can buy surgical steel pans I, i've met people that are chronically ill that, that when they changed their cooking pans that went away right we have to be savvy i want to close i mean i know it's getting kind of late here but i want to uh, one um it's a great story from the um the samurai tradition of um of the father who had these three sons 
and they were all studying to be martial arts warriors, you know, to, and, and to really live their lives, kind of like I'm talking about, with, you know, with awareness. Yeah. And so um, he calls the he wants to test them. So he calls in the youngest son, and so he, and, and so right behind the door. He's inside sitting in a chair and, this, and he calls in the first son and right behind the door, he's hired this martial artist uh, master to attack the, the, his sons as they come through the door. And so the first, the youngest son comes walking in, you know, and the, the guy behind the door attacks him and the son gets hit on the head, <laughs> knocked down, blood flowing, you know not good so okay so then uh the, so then the, the father calls in the second son second son comes walking in the martial artist attacks him the second son whirls around with lightning speed blocks the, and blocks the thing and knocks the guy down hmm. so that's pretty good he calls in the oldest son the oldest son walks before he even gets to the door he, he stops he goes wait a minute father What's going on here? I, I have a feeling something isn't quite right here. And the father said, well, actually, since you ask, I have a guy behind there. I was going to test you and see, you know, if you're, you know, how good you are. Father, you got to know better than that. You know, <laughs> so the lesson here is that those with the most training, those who are the most aware, create the least violence. Mm. Those who are less, less training, who are less responsible, less conscious, it's not that they're bad people, they're just gullible. They just don't really know what's going on. They are the ones that create the violence. They're the ones that create the, the misery because they don't know what's going on. They're, they're, they just don't, haven't taken the effort to train the, their mind. Their mind goes wherever the media takes them. They believe whatever the authorities say. And they create havoc and terrible dis disasters, really. It's only when we train our mind and learn to understand our true nature that we have our, like you say, our intuition is working and we're trusting ourselves and then we're savvy and we're less likely to kinds of things that, that contribute to violence. We won't be just easily deceived. You know, deception is a terrible thing. I mean, when someone is hit or stolen from, they know they've been harmed. But when someone is deceived, they don't even know they've been harmed. You can keep deceiving them over and over again and stealing and harming them more and more and more. And they don't even know. They still think you're, you're their friend, <laughs> everything. <laughs> I mean, deception is incredibly insidious. Yeah. But the thing you have to understand is that not only is being deceptive, that's evil, but being easily deceptive easily deceived, that's also evil. That's evil. If you're easily deceived, you're evil, really. I mean, that's something that's a that's a that's immoral. Mm. We we have a moral obligation not to be easily deceived. We have a moral obligation. And there's an old saying, you cannot fool an honest man. If we're not honest, we're easily deceived, quite honestly. People who are eating animal foods are not honest. That's why they get sick so much because they they just want to think, well, God gave us these animals to eat. You know, they're easily to see. They they buy into eating animal foods. They buy into taking drugs. They buy into believing in climate change. They buy into all this stuff because they're not honest, really, with themselves. They're and they and they they just want to fit in and trust authority. So we have to understand that we are called to um, to develop intuition and uh, what, what is called in the Buddhist tradition, uh, discriminating awareness, discriminating awareness, wisdom, so we can discriminate, we can see the faults from the true. And that is a challenge. It requires a lot of effort. And so, but we, but that's why we're here, I think, to make that effort and then do what you're doing, which is to help others create conversations and context to understand these. Efforts. I'm sorry, you know, I just realized I went, we went over to, well, I can take a couple of questions if there are questions maybe, but I, I should get going you know, okay. pretty soon. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing all of that. I think that's going to be very helpful for everybody. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's take just a couple questions, get over into the Q and a section here. Um, let's see. So Tessa, Tessa had a question about, um, so she's asking, so does Dr. Tuttle not believe in reducing your carbon footprint? What do you, what do you say about that? 
Oh, I don't believe in reducing your carbon. Footprint. <laughs> I mean, I don't believe carbon, a carbon footprint is um, this whole idea of anthropogenic climate change. I believed it. Actually, I, I actually did believe it up until maybe eight or nine years ago. And then I realized, wait a minute. I started reading some, I started reading more in, and I realized, I read a book called the hockey stick illusion. You have this graph, it's like a hockey stick. It goes like this yep. and like the, you know, global warming and carbon, you know, all this. And, and I learned, first of all, be, be wary of that kind of a thing. That's usually to try to manipulate you to think, Oh, no, something bad's going to happen. And I realized that there are so many climate scientists who say, well, that's not true. We don't know. I mean, carbon dioxide is actually you pump carbon dioxide into greenhouses to make plants grow. It's it creates life. It's the it's life. It, the idea of net zero carbon, the carbon dioxide is an enemy. That's a satanic idea. It, it's it's an anti life. You want you if you if we reduce carbon dioxide, I mean, it's so small already. It's like zero point zero point zero zero four percent, and and yet every you know, trees and plants and fruits, everything, that's all, car all the carbon comes from carbon dioxide. We want more carbon dioxide. I mean, you want more carbon dioxide is much better. You have much more growth. We're, we're, we're a problem too low in carbon dioxide. Uh, that's, and, and there's no link carbon dioxide. In I mean, if it, it, that, that whole thing is a myth. The IPCC, I mean, I've researched this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this without research. Okay. So the IPCC was put in by the, by the nations, influenced by the club, this whole, you know, they, they got together, Rockefeller, this is, this is Rockefeller again, uh, wanting to make money and control people. So you got to understand this, this whole climate narrative of carbon dioxide to reduce your carbon footprint. That's how you enslave people. How do you enslave animals, right? You enslave them by not letting them move. You, you can't go anywhere. You stay right here. That's called slavery. So they're getting us to agree to our own enslavement. You can't go anywhere. You can't drive because that's too much. You can't fly because that's too much carbon. You can't, you can't do anything because it's too much carbon. And so that's a, it's a total lie. There's no relationship between carbon dioxide and, and temperature. We have to understand that. That's a big myth. And, you know, the temperature is always climate change. I mean, climate change is going on. I mean, Al Gore, I remember in 2006, he came out with his big inconvenient truth. And he predicted that by 2015, the ice caps, there would be no ice caps, that Miami would be underwater. And, you know, he, now he has a big, he just bought a, a, an oceanfront mansion. You know, he's not worried about it. He knows it's a big lie. So did Obama. They know it's a lie. They all know. They all, they fly around in their big jets. Yeah. They don't worry about it. Are you kidding me? Yeah. How can we believe these lies? When they, they know it's a lie and they just laugh at us. I mean, yeah. they, they create people like Greta, you know, to scare us. We have, you, you know, you, you really got to question. That's all a big lie, the whole thing. Right. And uh, it's about enslaving humanity with 15 minute cities and carbon taxes, and which all puts more, more money in control. And it's about centralizing authority. Everybody has, you can only use th this much. You, you can only, and if you go against it, you can't spend your money. You can't go over there. It's all about centralizing control. Okay, that's enough to say. Yeah, no, perfectly said. Um, let's see. So, uh, VG. Oh, I was gonna say. You, you notice most of all of these people that are promoting this, they're they're the ones that support the industries that are destroying the environment in the first place. So you know they're behind exactly. All <laughs> so and, then, like... and oh, I know. And then if you look into green, so-called green energy, I mean, battery, the, yeah. the mining of 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 lithium and cobalt and nickel and all these things and copper that has to go on, and the slavery and the pollution and the windmills killing all these birds and and fish and I mean, this is it's devastating. We have to understand. There's there's a lot more to it. I mean, we I, you need to read my book. There's so much more. We don't have time, but yeah. uh, our, our our gas engines could actually. There, there's the, the fuel mixture is way too much on purpose because you use a lot more than we would need. You could cars that'll get 200, 300 miles per gallon by just leaning out the, and changing. You could, it could be done. It can be done. People are doing it. So we have to understand we're being manipulated on all these things. We could use a lot less fuel. They want us to use a lot more fuel than we need to use, but we have to be uh, savvy and understand these things, do the research. Yeah. Yeah, definitely.
Um, okay, let's see. So maybe one more question. Um, what, okay, are the one top, what are the top actions we can take in the middle of everything that's happening right now? I guess you, you did already kind of touch on that. Um, do you just want to give a few things people can take away? Yeah, okay, yeah. I think the, the main thing, of course, is to move and, and really live an organic, whole, plant-based diet, mainly uncooked is probably a really good idea. But you know, really eat a healthy diet. Uh, and and be aware of the water. Water's a big thing, and, and air. Uh, you know, be healthy. You know, take responsibility for your health. Your what you're reading, what you're taking in, meditation. You know, all these things, and quality of relationships, uh, and and having a meaning and for your life. I, you know, really connecting with what is the purpose of my life for this incarnation? Why why am I here? And do the best we can to fulfill what we feel is our purpose, and connect with creativity. Also, I think that's very important, and and take time every day for silent contemplation however that is you know for you prayer or meditation or or inner listening we tend to be so active and, and in, in a way forced into being active all the time but it's really this it's that's called yang you know yang energy but yin energy just being able to sit quietly and just be without having to be active and, and let let things come you know be open and be receptive to higher wisdom uh, to make that a regular practice every day. I think, that, you know, be very aware of how you start your day. I think the first hour, for example, uh, the, the very first thought be one of gratitude. And, and, and what, what can I learn and what, how can I contribute and be grateful for another day and, and, then, and then take time to, uh, to listen, maybe do some reading that's up, uplifting. Uh, connect with nature. Nature is, a, is the main source of health. The more we can connect authentically with nature. But what did, what did they do during the pandemic? They wanted people sick, so they wanted us inside. You know, sun and wind and rain and water and, and trees. Connect with nature, healthy food, like I was saying, uh, creativity. Find, find creative outlets, music, art, dance, writing, movement, yoga, the speaking, whatever it is, something that uh, allows you to connect with your creativity, because creativity and intuition are intimately connected and also with spirituality, which reconnects us with our true nature. Spirituality is everything. And spirituality is it. Spir we, veganism and spirituality are the same thing. Mm -hmm. Ahimsa, we are, there's one life living through all of us. We're not matter. Question all materialism. Materialism is the religion of animal agriculture. It's reducing beings to matter. Anytime that is coming up in your thought or you see it in the media, deny it. It's not true. We are consciousness. We are infinite life. And remember that and see that in others. And just send love to people. Walk by and just send love. Send love to everybody. Just, you know, you can sit down in the line of the post office and just radiate love. You don't have to say anything. And when, the more we do that, the more we just send love out to everyone around us and, and feel grateful for this life that we have. We will attract um, teachers and will attract abundance, but we don't do it for that. We do it to be loving. I'm not liberating the animals because I want to be healthy. I'm liberating them because I want them to be free. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the irony is, that's the great thing is, the more you try to be good and kind and loving to others, the more love comes to you. That's why people who harm others, in the big picture, they're, they're, they suffer. So we have to understand that and not go along with any of these narratives that cause suffering to animals or innocence uh, to people and and uh, be a, a, a radiating center of joy and love and kindness and compassion and mercy and just find our way to do that. That's really what it's about. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for all the wisdom you shared today <clears throat> with us. I'm glad that uh, everybody was here to join us. and. Um, yeah, I'm, so let's. I'm just gonna quick pick uh, a winner of the ebook. Oh yeah, and the, and the audio book. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna just go through here. Ah, uh, let's. Uh, it's gonna be. All right, it's Tessa today. So Tessa. Let me uh, email me, and I will uh, get you the ebook of twenty or Five Star Salad Revolution, and then we'll get you connected with Dr. Tuttle, and he can get you that uh, audio book for the World Peace Diet. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, if she, if Tessa would rather have an ebook of the World Peace Diet, <clears throat> she can have that or the audio book, either one. 
No problem. And I want to thank you, Matt, again, for the uh, great work you're doing. And thank everyone for listening. And never doubt that who you are, like you said, makes a huge difference. We really do, each one of us as individuals. So thank you for the opportunity. And go forth and multiply the message. And stay in touch. We have a website, worldpeacediet.com, or just my name, willtuttle.com. The new book is Food for Freedom. It should be out within the next one, one, one or two months. It's at the book designer right now. So we'll see. But, uh, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All those links are going to be in the description box down below, guys. So check out all of Dr. Tuttle's resources. I'm really looking forward to the book coming out. So yeah, we will. Uh, we'll. I'm sure we'll keep in touch. And I'd love to have you back on once it comes out and maybe talk a little bit more about that. Great. Sounds good. All, all right. right. Take care. Thank, Take care. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. See you next week.